So this, this is a text from 1960, Maki Fumihiko. He was a um, Japanese architect teaching at MIT, I think, at the time. And um, I have a few citations to describe what he is, what he is doing. Um, So he says, we are, we are fond of observing that our urban world is a complex one, that it changes with a rapidity beyond real comprehension, and finally that it is a disjointed world. So, no, why, why are we fond of this? Why, why are we fond of this? I think that's very important, because the, um, the gesture that he, that he then um, resolves in, I mean, so in principle this is about Re well, registering and recording, speaking about the world in which we live. No? So, so it's, it's a basic interest, we could say, that is not very specific for any kind of discourse. But what he is saying is, um, if urban design is to fulfill its role, to make a contribution to the form of city, it must do more than simply organize mechanical forces, make physical unity from diversity. It must recognize the meaning of the order it seeks to manufacture, as a humanly significant, a spatial order. So that what he is addressing thereby, and this is the 60s, you know, is um, our living environments are radically changing through technology. And they are changing in a way that a lot of people cannot relate to. You know? So the texts by Colas with Bigness, for example, are a good example of this. So there is a kind of an order, architects, urbanists design a kind of an order, and it feels like an order which is technical, it's not humanly designed or made. So what he is interested in is affirming technology, but keeping with what he will then call um, vernaculars. So keeping with regional, with, with cultural, uh, cultural, cultural distinctions. And that is a challenge to combine the two, because usually we think um, technology, this is physics, and then what we do with it, that is cultural. And the interesting thing about, um, about the, the text that you read is how it addresses the tension between the two. So the main concept that he, that he tries to develop for this is what he calls collective form. And collective is interesting to see uh, its etymology. It comes from gathering together. So collective is a kind of a, a gathering. No? And he says, um, there is no more concerned observer of our changing society than the urban designer. Because the urban designer is what he calls charged with giving form, with perceiving and contributing order to agglomerates of buildings, highways and green spaces in which men have increasingly come to work and live. They stand between technology and human need and seek to make the first a servant for the second must be paramount in a civilized world. So this is again addressing these um, radical changes that are happening. What is interesting is his clear identification. So we are charged with giving form. No? And that is at the heart of saying between culture and technology. Because form, that's like to say we can invent a geometry. So that is a colloquial saying on the, on the scale of a single house. But on the scale of geometry as mathematics, that is quite crazy to say. No, no one can invent a geometry. <laughs> so that's the thing about, about um, um, uh, yeah, dealing, uh, addressing technology as something which can be related to on a human scale. So then, interestingly, he calls it collective form, but he says it's not a collection of unrelated separate buildings, but buildings that have reasons to be together. And then he says, such an investigation is promising. No? He doesn't say, we can actually analyze the collectivity of this form analytically entirely. No, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not obtrusive, it doesn't impose itself. It's a promise, it's promising. So it's opening up a kind of a new gaze to study the environment 
And as a toolbox for how to do that, he distinguishes um, what he calls compositional form, then the megastructure as a form, and he introduces this one, which is very specific for metabolism and for his approach, which he calls group form. What is interesting, and this, and the, this is where his, um, his rhetoric becomes actually quite technical, when he begins to describe what these different kinds of forms are capable to do. He relates them to uh, how they structure space and time, and how they establish order. No? And you have with the compositional approach, we could say, so compositional form, compositional approach, this is with elements in space. So time is not really there, this is a bit like sculpture. With the megastructure form, which he relates to a structural approach, at the center is what is called in mathematics invariance groups. So we will, we will come to this, an invariance group. So the notion of the, of the, of the group means, and, the, and the, the notion of structure is very related to the group. And it means that between different contexts, there is something that links the two, which doesn't describe either one or the other but it allows for a kind of communication or exchange between the two. So a structure, so to preserve a structure means that you gain um, a space of flexibility and variability because this structure is somehow constant. No? But to call it constant would be mistaken because we cannot really say what the structure is, except from describing what it affords uh, to think in. And this allows us to, um, so, so what you can, there will be an example afterwards to, to, to describe more precisely what it is. The point is with structures we can really compose in time, like with the compositional form we compose in space. So we can look at the process and say it has elements, it has components, and those elements and components can be linked in various, in various ways. So we get out of a linear kind of process notion with this, and we approach what can be called a programmable temporality. So, raising these questions, I would like to discuss it before, or, or in the context of um, who is he talking to, where are these ideas coming from. So he's sp speaking about time, ordering, space, um, group, group form, he invents a kind of a social notion of geometry with the collective form. So what is, the, what is this addressing? And I think it's... Um, so I want to, to place this discourse. It's very clearly the beginning of cybernetics, we will see. But it's important to understand what cybernetics was or is. Um, so I want to place it in the context of what is called ontology. And it's something that in philosophy basically means sorting out that which participates in reality, no, in being. So, and it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the old, well, yeah, it's a very old notion, it's a very difficult one, it's a very abstract, very fundamental one. Um, that was always in the context of metaphysics. Now, only since the 19th century did it become independent as if it's an own field in its own right. And I'm saying that not because we need to be faithful to history and so on, but because that's very important, because metaphysics means a first philosophy, it means the question of principles. And the principle, this is what you probably have heard from, from metaphysics, it means, so what is the first thing? So principle, like prince, means who is the first? So it has a lot to do with arche, it has a lot to do with origin, and it has a lot to do with power. And um, in, in philosophy, then, you have different approaches that would say everything is uh, in, in flow, for example, so water is, is a principle. Or then things are at rest and they can be moved, so stasis is a principle. So you have all different kinds of philosophies based on that distinction. And to say, since the 19th, 17th century, that we can have ontology, so an order of sorting of how time and space can be organized, independent of such a principal question, um, this leaves the position of this principle open. No? And it is the position which will be taken by ideology and by, and by, um, by social theory, in a way. And that's where it relates so much to, um, to cybernetics. 
So <clears throat> today, when we speak of ontology, usually what we mean is a system of classification. Just a system of classification. Um, as such, it competes with, um, with, with, for example, systems theory. So you will come across that a lot, especially in sociology and in, and in biology, so when studying organisms. And then also cybernetics. Um, this is a Google search. Ontology books since 2010. But you see a handbook on ontologies, um, ontology matching, so there are different systems of classification. You have ontology theory and management and design. You have object-oriented ontology, you have model-driven engineering and ontology development. You have trading ontology, ah, no, okay, this is trading ontology for ideology, so that's an old-fashioned title. So then here you have chain, media value chain ontology, you have engineering, ontology engineering, no? Or then here you have something like terminological ontologies. So this is all, this is all quite interesting. Because it means we are calling ontologies what de facto are systems of classification. No? But why this is significant is precisely because the authority that we attribute to an ontology is a very different one than one particular system of classification. No? That is always arbitrary, but an, uh, but an ontology has uh, an, an air of philosophical authority, which today is very, very much in fashion. And I would like to explain to you a little bit where this comes from, because it's not simply that people, um, I don't know, don't get the history of this. So there is a reason to it. And the reason has a lot to do with, with the rise of computers and cybernetics. So cybernetics literally means the study of uh, controlling processes. So um, navigating and controlling processes. And this, this is exactly what, what, uh, what I was talking about with ordering time. So process means no, not only like in a, in a factory where you have linear rationalization process of how to produce something, but you can address any relation in a social as a process that can be, let's say, um, that can be governed without making decisions. You know? So cybernetics is a kind of governance in a, in, a, in a network, in a related context, where the, the position of the principle, which would be that which decides, is not visible, it doesn't appear anymore. No? So instead you have a gradual, uh, a, an adaptive kind, a, vari a variable kind of, um, of organizing the processes of governance. And that is something that has become um, ubiquitous. So almost all our institutions, our systems, our, our processes are organized according to, to such, a, such a thinking. And um, what is beautiful in, a, in this approach by Mackey, for example, by introducing abstract and complicated notions like a group form, is that he begins to attend again to the mathematics behind communication technology as a source for this new kind of governance principle, governance power. So mathematics becomes a kind of um, a wonder ground. No? So if, if we can understand the concepts that make this technology working, then um, we, can, we, can, we can be much more subtle and much more, we can relate much better to this new kind of technological order. So through understanding the mathematics, we can actually address the technical order as a humanly made order, because we understand where it comes from. So I want to give you very briefly main references. Um, one is, and this is for cybernetics, a book by Norbert Wiener. As you can see, it is called Cybernetics. Yeah, one cannot really read. Eh? Um, or Control and Communication in the animal and the machine. See, also control and communication in the animal and the machine. So this is the kind of temporalities of processes that become governable in a, in a, in a technical sense. So what is the, um, the mathematics behind this is what we had last time with, with uh, Le Corbusier with statistics. It's this kind of new quantities that are only working 
with a certain likeliness, but they are quantitative, but there is not really a substance to it that could easily be grasped. That's what he calls here. And then he describes um, yeah, how a new, a new kind of a, of, a uni, of a uniform science is emerging with information technology. Here we have an example of what is such an invariance means. No? He describes, so it's about nonlinear phenomena, so like electrical circuits, but also many other physical phenomena. They are characterized by an invariance with respect to a shift of origin in time. And that is a complicated thing to imagine, a shift of origin in time. But what it means is very simple. A physical experiment will have arrived at a certain stage by two o'clock if we started at noon. If we started at 12.15, it will have arrived at 2.15. So that is a kind of a time capsule. No? That is this, this flexibility of time processes that become graspable. And this is what is at stake when we are talking about structure or about groups. So this is a reference I would very much like to give you if you are interested in these in this, uh, in this, in this notions of the numbers, of the geometries, of the thinking behind it. Like where, where is this notion of invariance coming from? What makes it different from uh, something that we call constant, for example? What is a variable and so on? Um, this is a, a book by an, an, uh, an American mathematician and it's written for a public audience. So it's very accessible. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not just giving you technical concepts, it's really describing the genealogy of, of mathematical thinking. So this is um, highly recommendable. We can upload it on TIS. We have a PDF, just don't share it or don't say that you have it from here. That is an, um, a citation from the introduction to the book. Um, what he describes is, is, quite, is quite interesting because he raises the problem of what does that mean with generalization. So when we have this technical environment, some people feel it's not humanly made, I cannot relate to it. No, it's on a scale which I cannot perceive. I have no clue how it has been made. I have no clue what the possibilities would have been that have not been chosen instead of the one which is here. So we cannot relate to it. So then we, sp we say it's very general. And then we usually relate it with being empty, no? with being somehow sterile and, and uh, non-telling. And what he, so he is addressing exactly that. He's saying those who are not mathematicians by trade are sometimes inclined to confuse generality with vagueness and abstraction with emptiness. The exact opposite is the case in the mathematical generalizations and abstractions with which we shall be concerned here. So that's the introduction to the book. Each unappropriate and definitely prescribed specialization yielded the specific instances from which it had evolved. So for example, you have one theory of the, of the complex numbers, you have a theory of the hyper-complex numbers. So the complex numbers become accessible from looking at the hyper-complex. So it's a way where the abstraction gets richer and richer and richer, but more difficult to grasp. Yeah. So, so that is the relation with which he describes the book. And here is the yeah, beautiful, friend, uh, be beautiful phrase, moreover, each generalization in mathematics gives, an addition, gives in addition a whole universe of mathematical facts, distinct from those in the special instances from which the generalization proceeded. So, <clears throat> rather than going for directly form and ontologies, it is... Um, much more interesting, that's why we are talking about architectonic objects to, to, to cultivate domestication. So, the systems of ordering, they are um, today very much concentrating what can be called corporate powers or political policies, um, industries. So, a lot of the ontologies are actually driven by software companies. So, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very clear link there and how one can get a kind of a citizenship or a citizenship power is through learning the thinking. So that's what we would like to, to tell you. And, and the example of Maki um, goes in this direction. And the big question always remains how to affirm 
custom and culture and technology. How not to separate the two, but also how not to say, um, yeah, everything is, is culturally biased. And the, the text um, by, 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 by Maki and by uh, a lot of the other theoreticians in the context of cybernetics actually learn how to, uh, let's say, articulate the stance towards this. So it's about a technical kind of governing processes but then a different way of looking at such governance. And that's what makes the different approaches distinct from each other. So, now we get to the lecture and we continue in English. Normally we switch from German to English, but now we're there already. So, um, tonight we're extremely pleased to welcome Ryan Medina and Benjamin Reynolds from Palace or palace, palace, depending on the day, the mood, the weather, I'm guessing. <laughs> but um, they come as co-founders of palace, but also, as Vera mentioned, as insiders uh, at TU Wien, um, where they um, are visiting professors at the ATTP, uh, where they are leading the studio Domkos. Um, and palace is a group based in Basel um, that, and I quote, explores spatial and temporal breadth of history and geography to conceive of environments and phenomena that are often cartographic, virtual, and built. With this simultaneously minimalistic and inflationist um, definition of their practice, which I think Hans Verlein would uh, not disown, um, uh, and the very peculiar typography of the name, I think we will, uh, we will see it in a, in a minute, Palace sets the tone. The practice embraces time, space, matter and energy alike. Um, the terrain is the world, the endeavor is collective, and the craft diffracts, glitches, connects and deploys. Programs such as dwelling or urban farming are opportunities to developing floating yet precise proposals, carnal yet ineffable, telluric yet atmospheric. For the palace is at once a locus in the city and in the mind, it's the physical, architectural, mineral inscription of power, but also the memorial recollection of faces, of digits, of numbers, of places. So before we hear more about these extraordinary, extraordinary tales, I would like to also stress the fundamentally international um, identity of this group, which is a duo, because Raya Medina is um, a Spanish architect who graduated from the Applied Virtual Theory Lab in Switzerland and uh, is now based in Switzerland and teaching in Vienna, as we said. And Benjamin Reynolds is from Australia, he graduated in London at the AA, where he also teaches um, a, a diploma studio. So, again, this extremely international um, definition, I think. Um, I will just say that the exploration also brought them to the Netherlands, where they have been uh, residents at the Van Eyck Academy, but also to New York and to many other um, territories, and they have received numerous international prizes. I will just cite a couple of them, um, maybe the 50th annual Central Glass Award in Tokyo. And they are extremely prolific. So this translates into projects, but also books. They have a monography which was published last year, named uh, Paris Hermitage. But also um, they are engaged in uh, designing several exhibitions, uh, showing their work, I mean, in exhibitions, uh, both in uh, artistic and architectural venues. So. Please join me in welcoming Guayu Medina and Benjamin Reynolds. Um, thank you very much, Vera and Emmanuel, for such a kind invitation. We are very happy to be with you to, uh, this evening. Um, well, today we are going to uh, run through a series of of projects that we've made uh, or, the, or that are in the making in our practice. So bear with us if some things uh, appear sort of incomplete or somehow reopened. Really That's also a part of the, of the practice itself. <coughs> um, 
So we consider our works as conceits, borrowed from the metaphysical poets as terms of images in a speech. Our works are comprised of numerous discrete mediums that access ideas and rather than exchanging information with you today, only, uh, that is to say, to tell you anything, maybe you can perceive a position, an order, a place, and at the very least, a will. We don't claim to reconcile any of it, but maybe, maybe a little tonight. Uh, so relations within and around the mediums contribute to constructing a sense. After all, sense etymologically means a direction, as Vera in some occasions has also reminded us. Although mediums come from a goal, however, they are exhaustive, ideas are raised through works stemming from their interest in large acts of human endeavor, either encyclopedic, projects, expedition, taxa, etc., etc. We're detecting contours to reinforce the naturalization of, of our conceptual practice. Forcing nature is a contradiction, but in this sense we are trying to constantly reclass reclassify thoughts with actions. So <clears throat> a lot of this work has come from the understanding that uh, many domains today we're, we're all considered numerical abstractions in some sense, embodiments of anticipated behaviours. So our work becomes about a certain fetishization for the production of slang or images um, and we continuously extort our own characters uh, either to gain aut autonomy in the way that we find that our work often finds. Um, this, this comes out of the fact that this widespread turn uh, towards a, the performativity of life and of the internet has led to what we consider as the disintegration of opinions, m middle of the road blandness uh, and orthodoxies. This uh, performativity also hangs like a spectre over society um, where we are looking to require some kinds of truths, such that we are all retreating to certain traditions, retreating to uh, nationalism and indeed within architecture retreating to past stylistic formalisms. So this is the context which really feeds our work and in this sense uh, our work is a kind of a noir. Uh, we know that there is something missing, uh, perhaps it's undefined, but what exactly it is and how to find it we don't know. Um, so the first project <clears throat> It concerns a, an act at a solar collector just outside of Seville in Spain at dawn uh, about a month ago. It was enacted at the PS10 solar collector, which replicates the sun 624 times. Uh, the heliostats rotate and they track the sun, each constituted by a 120 meters squared uh, parabolic mirror. These heliostats direct sunlight to pipes filled with water, perhaps you know this already. They produce steam and the steam in turn uh, rotates a turbine to generate electricity. These tanks reach only around 255 degrees. This really was a work about trying to uh, find the cost uh, in energy of a, of a work. So <clears throat> what we created was a, a piece on a thick sheet of uh, PET plastic that melts at around 260 degrees. We positioned it in the night, ready for sunrise. And this is a photo uh, of about 15 minutes after sunrise. Um, on the left, at around 54 minutes, the sheet uh, reached 250 degrees. Can you see that? Yeah and it began to melt and it fell to the ground. Um, painted on the object itself, this screen, is the, the cutout of the sun itself. So the sun was reflected through an image of itself. On the left uh, is the average output uh, of each heliostat uh, during that time of the year. On the right is the resultant output of each heliostat at one point during those 53 minutes. So between uh, around 9 to 10 a.m., you can see this dip in the generated electric output. So the cost, the cost of the work was around 1.4 megawatts. 
So when the creative act coincides with the site of energy production, it's, it's doomed to be immoral. Um, why should it be that if a work is directly compromising something like energy, be considered any more immoral than a work of the same cost that was made on another continent, for example? It seems that this work is perhaps both about directly compromising a source because of its proximity and also the fact that it's literal, that is to say, not abstract. Um, to continue <coughs> with, uh, with Forum for the Missing, which is another, another investigation, uh, this Forum for the Missing is made in the midst of over 10,000 objects envisioned in European landscapes by participants from an on online crowd working platform. Crowd working is the idea that we can produce something collaboratively with tens of thousands of remote individuals. Typically, the crowd workers are classed as virtual mechanical workers. In this project, their job proposal entails the use of their subjective capacities to create the forum itself. Individuals located around the globe were invited to analyze one stock image each of a sky over Europe and characterize what shapes they see in the clouds to invite pareidolia, the tendency to perceive an image in an ambiguous visual pattern. This results in the creation of objects, part stemming from the image of a cloud and part the shape they see in the cloud. This is, for example, a horse. Uh, the entire forum is constituted by individuals uh, and their inputs uh, and actually, the work is planned something a kind to variations on the idea of a riverbed without the river. Computational scientists battle with pareidolia as one of the pitfalls of computer vision algorithms since they currently see faces when they should see window panes. In the forum, we are producing the work a computer is unaware that it is doing. Yes, objectively, they are clouds. They are even striated, cumulo nimbus, capillatus, cumuliform mass, dark cumulus fractu, dead cirrus, and so on. But, as we know, they are also horses or whatever the eyes is. This is the kind of stock image that was handed over to all the crowd workers, a generic European landscape, actually this one. Uh, in this case, individuals saw a horse in the shape of a cloud. A 3D image of that cloud was proposed and produced using a high field, which pro provides a kind of boundary alo along with a stock 3D model of a horse. Uh, this was digitally morphed using custom software to produce a final new and recognizable formation. What will result is the production of a massive survey of 10,000 plus human ambitioned objects. So, uh, at what seems like a different yet also customized grain of the project, um, a manufacturing assembly line is the space for sitting and transiting. Um, it is painted and backlit conveyor belts synonymous with automated work. And the objects are distributed in such a way that their arrangements almost embody a forum alone. Implicit directionality and centrality in the way that they are disposed indicates where certain activities should take place. So every piece has an inscription on it. One inscription is the number of the worker that participated in this uh, crowd working example or experiment and the other is what they saw in the image of the sky and underneath this platform is a luminous carpet uh, that that lies below everything um, and without really planning the forum um, but rather regulating the width widths of this belt um, it really just allocates the audience and a speaker and and that that is sort of emergent um, 
this is more of an axonometric composition. And each object is made of um, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Since the 1960s, this is a material that has been used for orthopedic and spine implants. It's uh, milled on a five axis machine. Uh, have you got sound? No. Mm -hmm. no, I don't think so. No, no, no. Um, we conducted a set of interviews with European virtual mechanical workers that uh, clearly led to discussions on their own working patterns, uh, their motivations for their own future, uh, the alternatives to improve such platforms because they are flawed, um, and alternatives uh, for the future of work itself. Uh, for the forum, the presence of firstly individuals precedes the existence of the whole forum itself. It's a certain expose in the, on the idea of implicit work, uh, where often we don't even know we are contributing to some kind of work online, either by feeding uh, a deep learning algorithm like uh, reCAPTCHA, or simply generating lucrative high resolution demographic data on fa Facebook, for example. So it's a forum to address this growing skepticism about the uh, legitimacy of the human worker, uh, though, it, though we're calling it a kind of complicit crowd collaboration, where conscious knowledge that one is actually contributing to something uh, on a scale that has really never been seen before. Um, okay. Something else uh, that we wanted to, to say is that during the presentation we are going to have a small time lapse of we call it, what we call interludes. This is one of them. Um, so basically they are placed between some more larger projects that we have completed. Um, we are going to introduce them as a, a enumeration of smaller mediums for, for projects. Um, so this one I will introduce you uh, is actually formed through the through the composition of inserts or cutouts from travels. Uh, this one, for example, was made uh, at a at a house that Johnson made when he was in his late, last years, and he, even himself was a big traveler for the time. Uh, and part of this visions that he had while traveling are embedded in the house itself. This particular piece is, has, is uh, called Three Towers. It's made with bitumen. Uh, it was actually collected from the Saudi Arabian desert cliff. We have just some other close-ups. Um, encryption 1 relates to a sign, uh, describing details and dimensions of the plan of a living quarter for one person. It's actually belonging to, to the site of a baseball pitch in Santa Barbara, California. You may recognize these works uh, a bit later during the presentation. Uh, this piece is actually the re reconstruction of the mural font in the Elizabeth Wolf bedroom. A textile, textile manufacturer who commissioned Miss van der Rohe uh, Wolf's house in Guben, Poland. This house is now demolished. But we, we are doing a, actually an unusual reconstruction of this mirror, which has a slight bend in, in, its, curv in its curvature. Uh, during the battering in the house, uh, a note was found written by its cleaner. The note was written in Catalan, uh, translating to just a soft brush and enjoy the breeze. The very same message was later produced as an inscription in the in the local glaze ceramics. Other thing hosted at the house was the geodesic rectangle, a piece cut off from a large body spheroid, equal in length to the draft of the now disassembled Japanese made petroleum tanker CY's giant. And finally here an earth is, is displayed at the, at the cliff of the house. It takes us back to the prototypical place uh, in antiquity for coming together. Okay. So 
So uh, the following project, uh, Paris Hermitage, <clears throat> as, as was mentioned before, is produced as a, a monograph recently, uh, is a, began really by uh, conducting a film entitled Space uh, Interference and Carving. Um, it's an act that came really as a rupture to the standard operating procedure of architects Often, uh, often basking in 3D packages where we are adding, we're compounding, we're layering. Uh, but this was really about an excavation process, a carving process. And so really just to reacquaint, reacquaint ourselves with the material again, um, but also to elaborate thought over time whilst carving, uh, with no formal preconceptions uh, and, and rather to manualize creation. So the numbers... Uh, in that feed there are a live transmission of the stone in 3D space. They themselves have their own patterns, this kind of interference pattern, which, uh, which then led to the creation of an application, which um, we consider as much the stone as really the stone itself. Um, this was the, the book that was recently released. And so, but the film uh, led to a, a building, and the project concerns the site uh, on the Seine, the site of the former St. Victor Abbey. Uh, the Abbey was formed by a group of rebel students who broke from the Notre Dame area. Uh, their original intention was to make an alternative circle for daily worship and contemplation, no longer praying and mourning. Uh, so they, they really focused on praying and teaching one another. <clears throat> um, so uh, for us, however, uh, sorry, the, the, the site of the Hermitage uh, began as an abbey, as I said, but also later became a textile manufacturing plant. It became Paris's wine production space or storage space, a lumber yard, and today it's the site of the Jusu uh, University campus. But for us, <clears throat> rather than the site taking a kind of central space within the project, it was the figure of one particular person by the name of Hugh, uh, who is this great mystical writer from the 12th century. Uh, and it was at the Abbey where he worked on his great project, The Mystic Ark. The ark, as you can see there on the right, was an educational tool. Um, in it, he tried to contain the entire cosmos, everything that was known at, one, at that point in time. Uh, a map of mundi, a zodiac cycles, r Roman calendars, systems of periodization, and weather related to geography, and so on. Um, the role of the device for Hugh was to simply organize curiosity in order to acquire knowledge. Um, one of his more famous quotes is to um, rid confusion since it is the mother of all ignorance and forgetfulness. In a way, uh, this work was kind of considered like a proto-internet, was this all-encompassing, very ambitious document that can be accessed, it's somehow mobile since this mystic arc was simply like a, a large painting that people could come and visit uh, that, that, that tried to contain every kind of knowledge. <clears throat> so, from early on, in, while working at the project, we, we collected thousands of edu educational spaces that appear over the years. For example, um, here on the left-hand side is the Sorbonne Library in Paris, or on the right-hand side, the St. Gallen Monastery in Switzerland. And they became quite instrumental later on to decipher the proportions and certain activities that occur, such as space. Uh, at the same time, now we propose a space uh, to know yourself by knowing all. Omnia dice, which is the Latin phrase for knowing everything. The Paris Hermitage is a place for elective contradiction to the reshaping of living practices by extreme conceptual abstractions made possible by the power of technology. Those that come from the city of Paris to the Hermitage are there to reconfigure their pulverized patterns of life. Those of work, wakefulness and sleep over a period of 39 weeks. Temporality is slowed and organized to understand relations. 
discussion, the sharing of flowing language is the basis of the conduct of the self. So this is uh, the ground floor. Uh, the street seclusion, where silence functions as the organizational principle, occurs in the central court, in the middle of the building. The ground court is a reproduction of, in sunlight of the Judean desert, beginning in the year 483 AD. This is the time and place of the birth of Cenobitic monasticism. Cenobitic meaning from the Greek common and life. One of the spaces in the plan, I mean some of the spaces are a library that provides quality and structured information, an amphitheater where collective discussion and the primary interface the, with the public actually uh, occurs. We have also the parler, which is a discussion, discussion annex for singular contributors and a refectory for communal eating and private living quarters, etc., etc. It's another uh, plan, uh, higher level. And here you can see other spaces like, as the classroom for the mutual verification of the will of contributors, a clinic for the monitoring of the mind, a simulator that closes the gap between virtual and the biological models of reality, actually a supercomputer, a herb garden. Uh, while compiling the spaces that, uh, from the Hermitage, the Curaçao Synagogue in the Caribbean, where the sun comes right through from the beach, came an important source. It was through this process of compilation of spaces that, is, that a study started to dissolve in the project a realization similar to that one of Henry Matisse when conducting his early studies on the permutation on pedestals, from the figurative to more abstract pieces. At the Hermitage, thousands of plants and sources led to a kind of every style with no classifications. What was considered were the capturing and freezing of vectors, what we call polarization, a phenomena of the domain of the microscopic, the infinitesimal. It is extreme fragmentation in matter. Uh, another source was the semi-domes of the Sorbonne Amphitheatre um, that, that were partially indexed. This is the, that was the auditorium of the, the Hermitage. This is also the Jerusalem's Dome of the Rock and the lattice which surrounds it, the way in which one can frame a geological entity within a building. <clears throat> but the Hermitage itself is made of these pulverized quartz crystals. Um, the quartz is crushed and fused at high temperatures. Uh, quartz was originally considered by the Greeks uh, as a source of solar energy, but it was considered as frozen water. Uh, on the left you can see the Nimrod lens, which is 3,000 years old, which is made to concentrate sunlight. And on the right you can see a synthetic quartz crystal grown by hydrothermal synthesis. That same synthetic quartz sits inside every personal computer as thin slices and acts as an its internal clock. And the precise angle to, to the crystallographic axis of this quartz defines the operating frequency of the computer. So the, 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 the small quartz crystal acts as a clock which sends signals to the CPU, but depending on how it's cut, it, uh, a computer can operate faster or slower. So essentially the, the, uh, the Hermitage is about registering certain behaviours. This quartz, which is somewhat malleable at a high temperature, is endlessly revisable agglomeration that yields the insignia of time. The construction and the refinement of the Hermitage is then able to break from the myth, myths of past foundations. It is a form of escape from the city itself. <clears throat> On site, the architecture is considered as emerging and the building becomes a kind of nature, a rock as a niche of ecology. This is the layout of components and how it comes as well structurally. 
And some other source is the Sacred Forest by Pauvet de Cabernet at the Sorbonne Main Auditorium. Actually, this uh, through observation, uh, we, can, we can identify certain personas uh, that act as disciplines, namely chemistry or geology or philosophy, and they all blend with each other. At the central court of the Hermitage, the horizon is wrapping the space of the desert. The desert being the, the quintessential site for being alone. The annual solar activity for the year 483 AD was collected and the UV data was extrapolated from uh, 1610 to the present for recreating this precise moment of in the desert of coming together. This is the adrogen of the Judea Desert, and these are uh, rooftop layers from top to bottom. It's a 30 meters diameter of diameter of polymer impregnated textile. Below is a UV light array, and even below, uh, collimating resting lenses that reflect uh, the light to recreate the accurate rays needed for this. Uh, light condition. These are other plants. And below lies the supercomputer, which is seen as a producer of conditions. This is a drawing starting from under the earth at the, at the Hermitage to the sky. The supercomputer sits below the desert. And these are some views of the interior. This is the auditorium where collective discussion and the primary interface with the public take, take place. The refectorium where eating uh, takes place facing each other. Uh, this is the living quarters. The library that contains one book. The connection to the Grand Court, which is the desert. A recognizable section cutting through the north and south axes. And these are acts which uh, concern a participant's relation to the daily, daily rhythms of the building and its material. So, in a way, the building ends the way we began by measuring an, an act with material from carving back to agglomeration. The limbs are the measuring tool for both operations. And the building acts along with that as a large temporal oscillator that yields time and commonalities in matter. And the contributors are in a sense renewed as intellectual subjects at the Hermitage by asking one another, what do we think of ourselves, what is our space and what can we be? The following are a number of uh, basement, what we call basement experiments, investigating the basic salt alkali coming from the Arabic word alkali, meaning ashes or salt world. Alkali was actually discovered by Iranian polymath Gerber in the 9th century. A combination of alkali made from burnt salt world and filtered animal fat, tallow, is how bodies were cleaned from 9th century until today. During his time in the Al-Kufa, uh, in, in Iraq, Gerber popularized the use of the alkali for cleaning. The first requirement for producing this work and preserving the ingredients uh, was to lower the room uh, to mean, uh, 10 to 10 degrees below. <coughs> Uh, this was achieved by using a fan and a pool of water. And it is a typical um, Middle Eastern technique using to freshen up living rooms in hot summers. This was the first impression that resonated with visitors coming to engage with this work, like entering a laboratory or a fridge. It was in the very surroundings of the mosque in Kufa that Gerber, the alchemist, used to frequent for, the, for prayer daily. 
This is the so-called plant salt world, uh, which burned, is used to create the alkali. And through the separation of ingredients that uh, we, yeah, that have a specific reaction to alkali, actually, several work were produced as a series. So by investigating alkali and its and separating different materials and kind of allowing them to react with it. Uh, some of these formations and geometries are related to Gerber's original vessels, where, which is where the alkali was first discovered. So these are casts which are uh, products of combining alkali and tallow, which is uh, filtered animal fat. So the materials themselves were passed through a process of formation by centrifugal force on a very primitive machine um, generated by a belt motor, which is actually a bicycle tyre. Can we go there? Uh, I think it's thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, maybe we can stop one more. Yes. Maybe. Escape. Oh, hold on. We'll get there. Maybe I'll switch. Okay. So those that centrifugal centrifugal force was helping or enabling these the process of formation of the two interacting materials um, that produce those uh, concave shapes. Um, the final material separation was using sugar with alkali to uh, achieve uh, crystalline laminas. These laminas were formed from rainwater from al uh, that was collected and preserved for four years since 2013. And in this example, the scale of the original mosque was reproduced at 1 to 100 in this model. The model is made from 40 kilograms of, of fat. Every four days, it's sprayed with mist for uh, one minute, which is the yearly rainfall of al kufa until, uh, until the piece disappears. So the following project, which appeared before in one of the um, interludes, uh, is Civic Canyon. Uh, it's concentrated around the life of a citizen who, who's living in Santa Barbara in California. And this is, was a client who is a wealthy 30-something individual. You could call him a cultural worker. But according to him, the city has removed any meaningful bodily and public interaction from his, from his existence to the point where he no longer feels a part of, the, of that place at all. So in a sense, this brief was very interesting from the outset. So in the development of several long conversations, we mutually established that while the client enjoyed life on the fringes of Los Angeles uh, and its culture, it was precisely the same culture uh, that's generated there which drove him to a certain apathy. Um, it was this widespread idealization of the body, or indeed this face, for example, this saturation of, of only a certain welcomed kind of physiognomy there, um, which came institutionalized really from the big six major f uh, film studios, uh, and Paramount being one of them. So the first thing we did was collect and measure this kind, quote unquote, kind of physiognomy of leading uh, actors who were christened by these studios uh, to establish these physio physiognomical norms. Um, oh, we don't have internet. Well, that's a Google map of the distance away from uh, this individual's residence and, and um, Burbank, which is really still one of the few places where you could say that Western culture is being produced um, uh, via the film industry there. What resulted was a single living studio. 
There is an old idea of the ancient coastal dwellers that the entire earth was nothing more than an island in a sea. Since after, since after trying and trying in vain to reach other lands, the coastal dwellers thought that their land was the limit on the earth. The medium that was responsible for the earth's floating, of course, garnered considerable speculation. It was not simply the water of the river. Instead, it was like the material formed directly under the firmament or lower heaven, crystalline, congelated, especially combined to resist the flame of the sun, moon and galaxy of stars, to be itself full of fire and yet not to burn. It was an elastic kind of material, water but not really water, air but not really air, fire but not really fire. At the center of the studio is the image of a proverbial fireplace with a light so bright that it's capable of heating the pool via an underfloor air fired heating coil. The entire floor becomes a floating hearth like that of the world, fourth world house. Since the interior and exterior are connected via the pool, it acts as the global temperature regulator. Yeah, yeah. That's right. This is a far fragment of the structure with dim poles, steel profiles, and braced by ropes. So it forms like uh, it form look, looks like a thousand of standard issue faces or chains that uh, are exported by the Big Six Movie Studios. It is for now located in Santa Barbara High School baseball team uh, home field the Tritons. Around it uh, is a pool with a material so concentrated with salt that only extremophile can grow. And this is uh, the new stylized uh, Triton logo. From the idea that one can have uh, a sense of belonging within the forms of the genes of leading actors, the floors of the Civic Canyon are stitched together by six, six posture grammars from work locations. A reclining position adapts postures in the way that ancient Greek Kleinai conditions sitting. Kleinai were used in symposia or convivia. Often, three Kleinai were arranged in a huge shape where dinner guests reclined during a meal in a normal recumbent position. So we really tried to use the kind of objective method to scan or trace these worldly postures, casting them on the floor slab. Um, this floating hearth, which is, uh, which is uh, warm, radiating. Um, this is a painting of Triton and Nereida uh, by Arnold Birkeland. And this is the hearth, this is the floor plate, which is able to uh, carry water but also give off heat. Um, so somehow in Civic Canyon, this, the client's body, the body that really doesn't feel it exists in Santa Barbara, is really never at rest. Um, it's never really in Santa Barbara. It can move between different scanned and traced pos postures across this uh, plate. So it's really culturally imbued um, and neutralized through the transfers of worldly postures. So it really becomes everywhere and beyond where it actually is uh, uh, geographically. So um, as with each of the interludes so far, this is another one. It, it briefly uh, explains a development of some work presented in uh, Finland, where we were again trying to construct a place or possibly more of a sense through discrete mediums of work. Uh, in this case uh, is a new plant for the company 3M. Uh, this is a piece of rare salt which was boiled uh, and, uh, and fell away. This is a low wall for a house. This is a scaleless recreation of a stone uh, to lift for exercising which was used traditionally in ancient Japan. 
Uh, it serves as a study for building footing. And at the Farnsworth house, house by Mies van der Rohe that was mentioned before, a system of hot pipes are installed in the concrete floor slab, um, which uh, depending on the fluctuation of the water levels, I'm sure you know that at that house the water rises and fills up the interior of the house. A lot of moisture and a lot of uh, excrement, which is precisely what's inside of this vessel, uh, was, was taken from the house itself. Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, the following uh, couple of projects are the result of two buildings in the northern Shandu province in, in China. They can be considered as relative buildings in the sense of a small family. And they are neighboring on site as well. One is a kitchen island, we could call it, and the other is a velodrome. Um, on the left hand side, uh, there is this island amongst, amongst a network of other islands, uh, water streams and bridges at a flower, flower farm at the site. This new island resembles the earthy island present in the meadows, that they are pseudo natural composites of rain earth mounds. The project is a continuation of techniques and forms of sharing in China as a shift from literal interpretations of its local ancestral legacies. It is configured to primarily support impermanent phenomena such as speech or natural light. On the right hand side, there is a the velodrome, which is an arena for track cycling at the intersection of a sport park and a botanical garden. Its geometry is a large sweeping roof enabling local customs and activities to take place underneath. For example, a shared marketplace or table tennis venue, communal dining area, etc. The island is a floating large room of deprogrammed space. In traditional China, villages and towns grew following symmetrical shapes. Symmetry was also important in the layout of the homes, altars and villages and it meant integrity and transparency. In this proposal, symmetry as well as existing logics of the flower farm, for example the existing earthy plant, planting islands, are borrowed to define uh, oval-like like plan. Uh, in regards to the velodrome, it is composed of a series of continuous lines and above on the track and below under the roof combine and produce uh, a, a form on its own. Um, on the left hand side, the, the kitchen, the building is designed by fully absorb, absorbing the sunshine, so because of this, its disposition and color also from the surrounding nature, acting as, uh, as if it were projected ornament. The materials are equally the field colors or the earth islands as accessed from any point. The flex of the roof is calculated to redirect sunlight deep into the interior and color kept by the neutral enamel substance coating its spaces. On the right hand side, the velodrome uh, Borrows notions of the building, uh, and even of the ceramic stoneware tradition in China, which uh, is characterized by simple shapes, compositional balance, and um, subtle effects in glazes. So, uh, on the left, in the kitchen, three activities are impermanent and mobile, supported by custom long tables and chairs for teaching and eating. One activity, however, is permanent and that of uh, food preparation. It takes place at the central position and balances the rest of this island. Um, on the right is the velodrome, which has a central court which features a densely planted area for outdoor uh, exercises. Here are these two uh, exponents uh, from a distance. The base of the kitchen uh, on the left uh, is made of rammed earth, which is an element of Chinese construction used for millennia in uh, grounds, walls, 
altars and foundations. Um, steel, large steel fragments are assembled on site. They are a result of CNCing steel beams and, and walls with a process of precision welding. And in the velodrome, uh, structurally the track has large steel beams embedded in huge concrete footings onto which hardwood, hardwood truss rests. Um, the final surface is laid with uh, laminate panels. In the kitchen uh, on the left, the main structural elements are the walls which support these concealed beams hidden in the roof. And in the velodrome, this appearance uh, of its continuity is achieved by 152 timber sections that are cut and joined onto the rigid truss work. This is a section of the kitchen on the left and a section of the velodrome on the right. Yeah, um, okay. <clears throat> so this is to conclude, in a way, uh, the conversation. So the... Oh, it, it does nothing. No? Okay. Uh, so, notes and details in a shallow creek is a following video work. Uh, we would like to conclude with it. And it's a piece that is a still information and is belonging to a larger project. Uh, in this Piece, actually, the book is considered as an elaboration of techniques born and extracted from nature. So it's knowledge at large in the way we consider it. The book was extracted from amongst 20,000 titles belonging to a real personal library of a collector. And the knowledge that once was nature, once inscribed in the form of a book and in the context of the, of the library, we see that it takes a, a life of its own and it becomes somewhat bacteria. Uh, what we question ourselves about is uh, if there are other ways of consolidating and engaging with content, um, can there be forms of post-consumption? Can the journey of a book reflect preciousness, imper impermanence or even the uncanny? Thank you very much. Thank you.